My name is Frank Sanders. I'm the head of the Telecommunications Theory Division at the Institute for Telecommunication Sciences, a laboratory of the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, NTIA, located in Boulder, Colorado. Over the past 30 years, we've developed a series of techniques for measuring emissions from various types of radio emitters. In particular, we've developed techniques for measuring emissions from radar transmitters. In this series of talks, I will begin by describing the fundamentals of RF measurement techniques, and I will culminate the series by describing our techniques for measuring emissions from radar systems, techniques that hopefully you can implement yourself. Accompanying this series of talks are notes available on our website and also NTIA reports that you may find useful. We hope that you'll enjoy watching this series of videos as much as we've enjoyed producing them. Okay, well, welcome to the sixth of the, of the series and the seminars that I've been giving on RF measurement techniques. The goal of the series is directed toward making measurements on radar emissions. And if you're measuring radar emissions, you're going to be confronted by a system that is typically transmitting extremely high power pulses that are very short and are relatively widely spaced, typically with a duty cycle, which is the ratio of the time on to the time off, of about 1 to 1,000 or about 30 dB. So the, so the question becomes, well, why do radar emissions look the way they do? If we're going to have to measure these emissions, uh, how can we understand what we're seeing coming out of these radars? So I want to take a break from the discussions that we've been doing about noise so far and just talk briefly today, relatively briefly, about how to design a radar because as we work through the problem of designing a radar, we'll see why the radar waveforms typically look the way they do. Okay, so what is the basic problem to be solved by a radar? Um, the word first appeared in the 1940s, and it's a pretty good description of what radars do. Radar means radio detection and ranging. And if you check the Oxford English Dictionary, you can find oh, the, so it's the an original acronym. citation. Right, so this is an acronym. <laughs> it is indeed. Um, and as the acronym implies, uh, it's a radio system which has to detect, I thought that was a good pen, a radio system which, ha which is going to detect something at some distance and, among other things, typically provides information on range to a target. Uh, and by the way, for radar systems, everything that they look at is a target, whether it's weather, a uh, commercial airliner, a boat uh, with a fisherman in it, or, or some kind of actual military target. The terminology that radar people always use is target for whatever it's looking at. So it's not target isn't meant in military sense for radars. It, target is whatever it's looking at. The um, technique that is used, which was developed starting in the 1930s, and which was developed on up uh, through the 1940s, those being the formative years for radar systems, was to somehow make an object at a distance radiate energy toward a radio receiver and use the energy to tell both what the distance to the, tar to the target is and what the uh, direction of the target is. Well, how can you make something radiate energy? Well, the way that you can do it is to fire electromagnetic energy at it and let it reflect the energy back. So the original uh, technique, which is, which is still fundamental, generally speaking, to uh, any radar system is to radiate energy out and to, in particular, direct the energy in a rather sharply shaped beam. And here we're looking at a radar from above, and uh, this might be, for example, looking east this way. Um, we shape the energy into a beam such that the edges of the beam are rather narrowly defined, and we transmit the energy out to some object out here, which, for example, might be some kind of a little airplane. And I'll draw like this. Got a little tail. and wings and some kind of a nose on it, and then let the object reflect energy back, 
to the source or sometimes let the target reflect energy off in a, in a different direction to a receiver that might be positioned over here. So given that we have a transmitter located at one place, we could either co-locate a receiver at the same location, um, which is a, sort of a classical radar, and which is referred to uh, as, a, uh, as a monostatic configuration. And this is a, the most typical configuration for most radars. But there are cases where you can actually place only the transmitter at a given location and s put a receiver at a second location, and this kind of configuration is called bistatic. And I'll mention bistatic radars briefly later. Um, but suffice to say that, generally speaking, the uh, receiver and the transmitter are uh, co-located. So the problem is now, how can we tell the direction and the distance to the target? Direction is done by shaping the antenna uh, beam rather carefully. You will get side lobes and back lobes, but we try to have one really big, well-defined beam. So we'll know the direction of the target simply because when we see the target, we note that we're pointed in some direction toward it. The distance problem is typically solved by transmitting not a continuous run of RF energy, but rather to transmit a very short burst of RF energy like that. Let that burst travel out in space, let the burst hit the target, let the burst come back again and simply measure the travel time from the moment that we emitted the burst until the moment that we heard the echo from the target um, come back to us and then um, just use the fact that um, uh, rate, which is the speed of light, times time interval is equal to distance to uh, know that uh, the thing must have been off at a particular distance from us. And of course, if, if we're running with a, uh, with a typical monostatic radar, uh, then the interval to go out and come back is actually equal to two times the distance, so we have to, of course, divide by two. Easy enough to do, and uh, in the 1930s, people first began to notice that they could actually see energy uh, from large objects like ships, um, electromagnetic, electromagnetic energy uh, being disturbed by large objects like ships. For example, a ship would sail through a channel and they would see a disturbance in energy and a communication link across the channel. They used this by the 1940s to produce these sorts of pulsed emissions where they were intentionally looking for the uh, distance out to a target and back. And just as a historical note, uh, because this is, uh, bears a little bit on the discussion that we'll have, the earliest radar systems were actually um, configured very much like oscilloscopes at the receiver end. And you'll still hear these referred to to this day as A-scope. Uh, displays, A-scope displays. And in an A-scope display we actually have the uh, kind of noise that we generate in an oscilloscope and we actually observe uh, pips in the time domain on the scope display and we literally use a graticule on the scope display like this to measure the time of arrival of these pips on these A-scopes and these were the original radar displays. And as you can see here, the, this kind of display was not showing anybody on the display itself anything about the direction to the target. You just get the distance out to the target. You had to have a second display sitting somewhere that showed you the direction that your antenna was pointing at a given moment. Still, these were uh, uh, very effective early radars. And, and uh, uh, this is roughly the kind of design, for example, that's being used at uh, Pearl Harbor when uh, Japanese planes were observed on December 7th by some radar operators who saw a really big set of target returns out here and, and called in and said, hey, we see this big set of target returns. Uh, and they said, oh, don't worry about those. Those aren't uh, nothing to worry about. <laughs> but now, more modern radar displays operate as what are called plan position indicators, PPIs, plan position indicator, plan position indicators. And a PPI scope puts the operator at the center and displays target returns at various locations relative to that and typically this direction at the top of the display is north, 
and the beam does typically sweep uh, clockwise along with the uh, mechanical rotation of a highly directional antenna. And as that antenna rotates and targets are seen at various distances, those targets actually light up as this thing uh, rotates around. These are easy to build as analog systems and nowadays many of the ones that you see actually still look like the old analog systems where an electron beam was being drawn back and forth and, and uh, was being used to illuminate a, a phosphor display except that now they're generated in software. Um, <laughs> And, it, and it's kind of weird to see one of these things being generated totally in software when, in fact, the, in, in many respects, it's actually easier to generate them actually as an analog display with a beam rotating. Okay, so with that said, it's just a, a couple of brief introductory remarks. Here's the problem that we want to work on solving. First of all, uh, what data do we want to retrieve from the radar. Uh, we can retrieve one dimensional data, one dimensional data, which will typically, or normally, be distance only. And you might say, well, why do I want to know just the distance out to something? Well, for example, if you're operating a spacecraft and you want to dock that spacecraft to some other uh, object in space, then all you need to know really is the distance is the distance to your target as you're closing on it. You, you're either you using a sure. uh, computer control system or using some sort of a manual system to, to align yourself on it. You just want to know how much distance you have to go before you touch something. And there are other applications for one-dimensional radar. You assume that you're lined up. Assuming that you're lined up, right. <laughs> and, and that uh, isn't always a trivial problem. Two-dimensional data are the most common, and two-dimensional data are typical, typically, as I was saying, azimuth and distance out to a target. And for a two-dimensional radar system, which has an antenna, which in cross-section might look a little bit like that, the beam shape that is formed, seen in cross-section, seen from side on, will look something like this. And we'll have one big kind of a maybe side lobe and some side lobes down here like this. So it's a two-dimensional radar typically has a very broad vertical beam pattern. Uh, this, this would be uh, uh, typically several, when I say broad, I mean typically several uh, degrees wide, going from somewhere near the horizon up to several degrees above the horizon. But if we flip this over sideways, so we're looking at it from above, the beam pattern seen in cross-section from above, flipped over, will look rather narrow. And again, we'll have some side low patterns out here. But will look rather narrow. So this allows a target to be isolated in azimuth while the thing's rotating, but it doesn't return much and sometimes no, many times no, elevation information whatsoever. And of course you might immediately say, well, wait, whoa, 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 how, how do you find the target's elevation? Well, for that you either have to have a second radar, which has a very narrow beam in elevation, which actually goes to, we'll say that Steve is the target, goes to the azimuth of the target and nods up and down like that to find Steve's elevation angle above the horizon, mm -hmm. and that's called a height finder radar. Or we have Steve equip himself with a beacon uh, in his aircraft uh, cockpit, and the beacon uh, is a completely separate system which reports his altitude back to air traffic control via a separate communication link and has nothing to do with the radar whatsoever. <laughs> it also re reports his uh, identity. Uh, as some sort of a coded number. So, uh, uh, these are very common radars, but, but do bear in mind that typically these kinds of radars, whether they're used to find aircraft or whether they're used on a boat to look at things on the surface of the water, are only two-dimensional. Then, there are finally, uh, maybe not finally, but there are three-dimensional uh, radars, and these find um, uh, uh, azimuth, elevation, angle, and distance. Like so. Now, in order to do that, the radar has to, has to form a beam, which is uh, typically referred to as a pencil beam. 
pencil beam, and the pencil beam is three dimensional, is 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 three dimensionally narrow all the way around. It, literally, a, a beam which is which is shaped a bit like this. Now, uh, trade offs. Everything everything in radar design is always a trade off. You might say, why not build every radar to be three dimensional? Wouldn't that be great? Well, first of all. Uh, you don't always need a three-dimensional um, system for radar. For example, if you're on a boat and you're looking for things on the surface of the water like bridges and other boats and people swimming in the water or periscopes, you don't need three-dimensional displays. You only need to search everything in two dimensions because the surface of the water is basically a two-dimensional problem. Even for air search, however, the uh, th uh, three-dimensional system presents problems because, because it, as the beam becomes very, very, very narrow, um, and not to jump ahead too much to the problem of searching, but how do you search a very large volume with a very small little beam? Well, it takes a really long time. Whereas, if we're using this kind of a beam, which is very, um, which is very broad in elevation but very narrow in azimuth, and uh, this is uh, typically uh, a cosecant uh, squared shape. It's also called a fan beam. This kind of a beam can be used to, sw to, to uh, sweep along the space very efficiently because we can sweep from the horizon up to several degrees above the horizon in a single rotation of the radar and we don't have to waste a lot of time looking up and down like this while we're going. So two-dimensional radars can, uh, can uh, typically search space, uh, large volume of space faster than a, than a three-dimensional pencil beam can. And again, I'll talk about this a little later regarding, say, weather radars that use pencil beams versus air traffic controls that, uh, radars that use two-dimensional beams. Can you switch from one type of beam to another? In principle, In other words, after yeah. you reach a certain point, then you want with a broad, and then you want to go like this with a more in pencil sharp. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in principle, you could, and um, I'm not thinking of a radar offhand that does that as such, but, but I do know that that kind of strategy uh, used to be pursued with old, with old weather radars. Uh, old weather radars, uh, like modern weather radars, had a pencil beam but they would typically simply rotate the beam around the horizon like this, around and around and around, until they saw something really interesting like a big thunderstorm, mm -hmm. and then they would stop on it, and then they would nod the beam up and down vertically through the thunderstorm to actually look at it in three dimensions, and you actually have little controls you, just, you can use to sit there and nod it up and down. The newer weather radars actually do a big conical scan pattern. They go like this, then they drop the beam, then they do a 360, then they drop the beam, then they do a 360, then they drop the beam again. It takes them ten minutes to search a yeah, complete line of space. Wide, but, just scan around with the wide, and then you know, right. here I have it, and now you just have very, very narrow. And you know, I don't know of any radars that do that, but I'll mention later uh, radar antenna designs, which actually um, are formed completely, which form the beams completely electronically, and in which, in principle, you could actually do that. Um, I'm not sure that they're anywhere they implement that, but in principle, you could. In any event, so the problem is uh, to, first of all, define what kind of a mission you want to solve for a radar. Um, the mission that I'd like to uh, solve first is that of, in fact, a two-dimensional radar, which will find the azimuth and distance out to uh, aircraft or any other airborne objects um, at some distance, because these are very common radars. They're used uh, um, around the world for air traffic control. The military, of course, uses them uh, both on ships and from terrestrial stations and from airborne stations and, in some cases, even, although not, not this type of design, even from spacecraft. So I'd like to talk about the design of, of, uh, of uh, one of these sorts of, of radars. So let's consider the problem of building a radar that will uh, have one of these wide vertical elevation beams with a cosecant squared pattern, a so-called fan beam, which is going to repetitively uh, search through space by rotating the beam 360 degrees around over and over and over again, and which, when it sees a target, will produce one of these planned position indicator uh, displays that shows the distance to the target radially across the display and shows the azimuth to the target um, from, say, north. So. Hey, Frank, could yes. you just throw out some names of like radars that oh. would, would be two-dimensional? Sometimes, you know, if you're sure. here on the radio or something, they're talking about a certain type of antenna. Oh, yeah. It'd be nice to know if they're two-dimensional or... Oh, yeah, okay, I'll do that. Uh, the, the, the question is, what about some radar names and some names of some typical types of radars that work this way? Um, interesting, you should, interesting, you should ask, because there are uh, two sorts of naming schemes that are used in the United States. One of them is a classic scheme, which is the AN scheme, which stands for Army-Navy, because it predates the development of the U.S. Air Force. 
And in the AN scheme, there are three letters followed by a dash, followed by um, two numbers. I'll go L, L, and L for the three letters, and then N1 and N2 for the numbers, L1, L2, and L3. Letter one, letter two, letter three, and then number one and number two. And sometimes you, it can actually go all the way, well, it can go arbitrarily, it could go to number three, but there aren't too many like that. The uh, first letter tells you the basing mode for the radar. Now I'll explain this in a little more detail in a second. The second letter tells you that it is in fact a radar and the letter that is used to designate radar is P because R was already taken for radio. <laughs> and the, early, <laughs> the earliest of all US radars was actually developed before this naming scheme and it was called an SCR which st stood for uh, signal Corps Radio, and they were operated by the Army Signal Corps, Signal Corps Radio. In fact, it was an SCR radar that was operating at Pearl Harbor yeah, actually, on the December 7th, 41, Corps right. Radio. But later on, they got, they got rid of these designations. They start going to the three-letter designations. R stood for radio, and so they needed something for radar, so they made that be a P. So, so any radar will always have P as the, as the middle designation, and then the um, third letter tells you what the radar's functionality is, what its function is. And then uh, the uh, three numbers uh, are just, are, are nothing more than series numbers. They start counting at one and work their way up. So I'll give you a few examples. Um, an APN is an airborne, uh, and we'll assume that the P means radar, so I won't do that. Airborne navigation radar. And APG is airborne fire control. The G apparently standing for gun. <laughs> um, APS is airborne search. Okay, and so forth. Now, uh, suppose that we have an SPS. What do you suppose an SPS would be? Shipborne. So shipborne. And then you can see how that we could have an SPS, an SPG, uh, an SPN. If it's an SPN, they'll call it a spin. They, they type it the spin 43. Um, another one is FPS, which is fixed. And uh, this would be a, a terrestrial uh, radar at a, at, a, at a fixed location. Um, we can also have an MP. S, which means mobile, which is a radar which nominally can be moved around on the surface of the earth, but not shipborne. It's got to move on, on some kind of hard surface. Right. And so forth, right, yeah. So so as so when you when you understand these kinds of designations, then then um, you can immediately determine the, the general functionality for a radar. Um, another uh, one that's not obvious is MPQ, and that it would be mobile. And the Q just means uh, general uh, purpose or uh, multi-mode. General purpose or maybe multi-mode, depending. Uh, Weren't you guys talking about a TP? Ah, now, now we come to TPS, and TPS means transportable. <laughs> so we have fixed, we have mobile, and we have transportable. <laughs> well. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly myself don't know how they pick between the M and the T. But if someone says that they have have something like a, a TPS 77, then what they have is the transportable radar search um, model 77. And in fact, um, one of the first earliest radars, uh, Chris, uh, that was built, which has this, the kind of functionality that we're talking about, a two-dimensional long-range air search radar, was in was in fact the tip the TPS one, which people call the Tipsy, the Tipsy one, and they went through uh, several uh, models. There was a Tipsy one A, one B, one C, and finally the Tipsy one D. And in fact, we'll design a radar here that's a little bit similar to to a so-called Tipsy one D. Uh, this is a World War II uh, designation, <coughs> World War II designated uh, type of radar, um, and this forms a good segue into an alternative naming scheme. 
This naming scheme, as I implied, is used by the military. It's called Army Navy, and in fact, the Army Navy, Air Force, and Marines in the United States use this naming scheme. The, an alternative naming scheme, which I'll write in green, is used by the Federal Aviation Administration. They name radars based upon um, using acronyms that sort of spell out the radar's functionality. For example, the FAA has ASR 5s, uh, 7s, 8s, and 9s, and in fact I think nowadays they're pretty much all 8s and 9s, uh, and some 11s. ASR, ASR 7, 8, 9, 11, etc. ASR stands for Airport Surveillance. And these radars are often found at airports, and they're two-dimensional search radars that have roughly 100 nautical miles range. And so anytime you see ASR followed by a number, you know that that's an FAA radar and that it's an airport surface, uh, uh, sorry, uh, air, airport surveillance radar. They also operate long-range radars called ARSRs, and they have the ARSR-1, the ARSR-2, the 3, and the 4. ARSR stands for Air Route Surveillance Radar. Air Route Surveillance. This is a reference to the long-range Victor Air Routes that cr crisscross the United States. And where the ASRs have something like 100 nautical miles range, the ARSRs have something like a 200 nautical mile or so range, maybe even a little longer. But I'll show you what the limitation is on range and it's not how much power you can generate. Air route <laughs> surveillance <laughs> radars. So people will refer to ASRs and ARSRs. Now, they would have had an airport surface surveillance radar, which would have been the ASSER, but that wouldn't have worked well. So, radars that are used at airports to watch traffic on the ground are called ASDs, which stands for A-S-D-E, and that stands for Airport uh, Surface Detection Equipment, ASDs. There's the ASD-1, ASD-2, ASD-3. We recently did measurements on the ASD-X, which operates in so-called X-band. So if you see a designation that looks like ASR, ARSR, or ASD, you know it's an FAA radar, and you can immediately tell what the functionality is. The Weather Service's mainstay radar also uses an acronym for its name, which is NEXRAD, which stands for Next Generation Weather Radar. NEXRAD. Channel 9 News. NEXRAD, Channel 9 News. Um, next Generation uh, Weather Surveillance Radar. The next rad started off as a radar that was going to combine the functionality of long-range air search and weather surveillance, and it didn't work out. Um, it's like trying to build a, a, a vehicle that's going to be a terrific sports car and also carry two-ton loads. You can't get both functions in the same unit. So they finally gave up on that. The next rad became a weather radar, and the uh, FAA went ahead with development of, of a new ASR-type radar, because the two uh, uh, functions, as I say, are antithetical to each other. You'll see some other uh, acronyms for radars. Uh, there's one called the GBR, the ground-based radar, which is a giant X-band, and I'll talk about bands in a minute too, a giant X-band radar that's, that's uh, being developed to look for uh, uh, missile warheads. But the classic is still the Army-Navy uh, scheme. So the TPS, so to, to connect these two, the TPS-1D led directly in an evolutionary development to the ARSR-1 um, uh, version 5, which is E, the ARSR-1E. ARSR-1Es uh, are very similar to TPS-1Ds. Now, they have gradually over the years upgraded various electronics from tube electronics to solid state, but um, in many respects, the characteristics of these radars are very, very similar because, as it turns out, if you're going to look for targets at, uh, at certain distances with certain cross-sections, you're basically locked into um, uh, certain parameters. Uh, one other thing worth mentioning, since we're talking about nomenclatures, uh, are radar bands, frequency bands. We are, after all, worried here about RF measurements. Talk briefly about these. These, again, you'll see a common thread running through all this, which is that a lot of the uh, technical nomenclature concerning radars dates straight back to the Second World War. The Army-Navy scheme for naming them, and um, um, uh, uh, the uh, functionality, and um, let's see, what was the best? The, so the, um, well, what do I want to go with this? Okay, so 
Uh, frequency bands also designate um, frequency bands also date back to the Second World War. Uh, these bands are referred to as P, L, S, uh, C, X, and then we have a variety of K bands, K A, K U, etc. These were originally code letters that were used to confuse the enemy. Nowadays, they just confuse us, but they're still used. <laughs> P-band is 420 to 450 megahertz, and it's also referred to as, predictably enough, UHF. People talk about UHF radars. Uh, L-band, now these are current band designations. L-band goes from 1215 to um, 1400 megahertz, so-called L-band. Uh, S-band is uh, 2.7 to basically uh, 3.7 uh, gigahertz, gigahertz, 20, that is to say 2700 to 3700 megahertz. Uh, C-band is, classically anyway, is 5250 to, um, 5050 to 59 25 uh, megahertz. I like to go back and forth. <laughs> and then X band is 8.5 to 10.5 gigahertz. Now, um, because the gain of an antenna, if it's being used at microwave frequencies, is going to be in some sense proportional to the size of the antenna, and because we're looking for high gain in radar antennas, the reason we're looking for high gain in radar antennas is we want the antenna beam to be very, very tight so we can isolate a target in space. Um, the lower frequencies require larger antennas to get the same equivalent functionality. So um, these antennas go from larger to smaller in a descending sequence like this, larger to smaller for radar applications. And that means that um, these antennas at X-band are well suited to use on uh, uh, small uh, ships, boats, um, submarines, because when a submarine surfaces, it needs a radar to uh, um, avoid hitting anything on the surface, uh, and aircraft, if you're mounting it in the aircraft nose. Up in the, if you're trying to jam up, if, if, if the whole, and we'll look at some pictures later, if the, no, the nose of the airplane might only be about this big around where you can mount the radar, you got to get an antenna in there. You want that antenna to have really high gain. It's going to be hard to do that at these kinds of frequencies, but you can do it up at these kinds of frequencies. So typical aircraft uh, units that are mounted up in the nose of the plane are going to typically be operating in X or K band. Uh, 5250, 5925 is kind of intermediate, but by the time you work down into here, you're looking at radars that are rather large that are going to operate um, in terrestrial applications like that one on the wall right there. That said, there are airborne radars that operate down in this band right here, and these radars are not mounted in the nose of the plane, they're mounted in a gigantic rotodome that sits up on top of the plane. Uh, the U.S. Navy, for example, has, has, a, has a series of radars that operate in there. Yeah, the so-called AWACS, or for the Navy specifically, the so-called Hawkeye systems. Um, Air Force AWACS uh, operates in a different band, but <clears throat> generally speaking, the tailoring between these bands and the radar uh, application depends upon how much gain you can get into a certain antenna size versus how big an antenna you can get on your platform. <laughs> you, the platform being the basing mode for the radar. Platform is a ship, it's an airplane, it's a vehicle, it's whatever you want it to be that you're going to mount the uh, radar in or on. So just a, just a quick note on that too. PLSX, PLSC and X. Oh, and to confuse the issue even more, on band designations, people who build electronic warfare systems have a band designation system that goes A, B, C, D, E, and so forth, up through uh, I, J, and K, roughly. And the ECM, electronic countermeasures, or ECCM designations, electronic counter countermeasures designations, have nothing to do with radar band designations. So if someone says it's, an, it's a D-band it's a D-band system, they're talking about an electronic uh, warfare system of some sort. And those band designations have nothing to do with radar designations. Where it does get confusing is if somebody talks about a, uh, say, a, a C-band system, <coughs> 
because then you're not sure necessarily whether they're talking about radar C-band or electronic countermeasures or electronic counter countermeasures or I should have said EW, electronic warfare band designations, then you have to work from the context or ask them, wait a minute, did you mean radar C-band or electronic warfare C-band? So, uh, as I said, nowadays these band designations confuse us rather than the enemy, but... Um, now, <laughs> any questions on that so far? So, so Chris, I, I know that's kind of a long answer to your question, but when you, when you hear a designation on a radar, you, that'll give you some idea uh, of what someone's talking about. Okay, so the problem that we have is, um, first of all, to figure out how much power we're going to transmit out of this radar so that we can get a detectable echo coming back. And basically, here's how we're going to build the radar. We're going to, uh, first of all, construct this as a monostatic system, so we're going to co-locate the transmitter and receiver. And I, I should say this, this is something that Merrill Skolnick actually commented to me uh, well about a year ago. Uh, all good radar systems have a single genius who designed them. There may be hundreds or even thousands of people involved in the overall design and the overall manufacturing problem, but there's one person or a couple people who work very closely together, or the one person who works alone, who says, this is what I want. It's like an artist saying, this is the painting I want to make. This is going to be my masterpiece in, in electromagnetic engineering hardware. And so we're going to undertake this. First of all, we have a transmitter which is going to be connected to some kind of high gain directional antenna and we're going to fire pulses of electromagnetic energy out in space that are going to run like this one after another and they're going to hit a target and they're going to echo back but when targets are being um, uh, processed for echo information we're going to have to turn our radar from a, tr from a high power transmitter system into a receiver system like so, and so what we have to do at this point is put what amounts to a switch in here like this, and this is called a TR switch, TR switch transmit and receive switch. There's also a scheme called a circulator, which uh, takes energy in this way, radiates it out, but energy coming back in this way uh, is uh, routed out of the circulator back down to the receiver, but you have to either use a circulator, which is drawn like this, or a TR switch, which will be drawn like a switch going back and forth, to ultimately turn the radar into a high power transmitter and then into a very, 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 very sensitive listening device. And this is a, a sort of a paradox in radar design. Although radar has produced the highest peak power levels of any radio transmitters uh, that exist, radars operate typically 99, and we'll see why this is not 99.9% of the time as extremely sensitive passive receivers and this is what makes them by the way sensitive to interference <laughs> so it, it alternates between spending a tenth of a percent of its time um, 0.1 percent of its time running as a high power transmitter versus running as a very sensitive receiver 99.9 percent .9 of the time uh, now how does this relate to the power we're going to generate? Well, given that we're going to run this as a very, 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 very sensitive receiver we want to know well what's the minimum amount of energy that we can receive we will assume for the moment that the bandwidth of the receiver is going to be about 1 megahertz, and you'll see why in a minute. But the receiver bandwidth is going to be about 1 megahertz. Now remember, uh, KTB is equal to minus 174 decibels relative to a milliwatt at a temperature of 290 degrees Kelvin. Um, if bandwidth is equal to 1 hertz, and remember K is... Uh, 1.38 times 10 to the minus 23 uh, joules per Kelvin. Boltzmann's constant. So we want to run this in a 1 megahertz bandwidth, one, uh, 10 log of 1 megahertz, 10 log of a million, is 60 dB. And let's assume a noise figure for the receiver that's something on the order of 5 dB. A real noise figure might be a little better, a little worse, but we're going to get an order of magnitude number for what we're going to have to transmit here. So, the, so this radar is going to have a noise floor. This radar's noise floor is going to be equal to minus 174 dBm plus 60, for, which is for 1 megahertz bandwidth, plus 5, which is the noise figure. So that's minus 109. DBM. 
and I want to do this problem in MKS units, so I'm going to uh, set that equal to decibels relative to a, not a milliwatt, but a watt. So that's minus 139 decibels relative to a watt. And that means that the uh, number of watts for the noise floor of this radar is going to be equal to 10 to the power of minus 139 divided by 10, which is 10 to the minus 13.9. 13.9, which is basically 10 to the minus 14 watts. That's, that's going to be the actual noise power in this receiver. 10 to the minus 14 watts in that bandwidth with this noise figure. Now, I want to see a target Anything? echo coming up out of that. I know, it's amazing. 10 to the minus 14. You don't often I mean, see 10 uh, to the minus 14 of anything. You know. A beacon may this kind of... Right. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, we're not talking about picowatts. We're, we're, we're down here at femtowatts of power. 10 to the minus 14 watts. And we want to see a target echo come out of that. Well, we know from our previous discussions that if a target echo were to be received in this receiver at a power level that's equal to the receiver's own noise floor, the echo itself would come up out of the noise floor by how many dB? 3 dB. Ah, everyone's been listening. Yeah, that's good. Okay. So if we want to see a target echo 3 dB out of the noise, we need to make the power in the target equal to about, give or take, this is order of magnitude, 10 to the minus 14 watts. Good. Now we're on our way. Remember that number. I'll write it on the next board. 10 to the minus 14 watts, indeed. All right, we'll get rid of all this. Okay, 10 to the minus 14 watts. So we have to, we want the power that we receive to be equal to something on the order of 10 to the minus 14 watts. Okay, now, I'm going to start producing the so-called radar equation. There are many manifestations of this equation, but this is an easy one to derive in the back of an envelope if you're ever just sitting somewhere. Someone walks up to you in an airport departure lounge and says, hey, can you derive the radar equation for me really fast? Like, no problem. I've got, I got just, I can do it for you. Okay. that happen once. It can happen. It can happen. How often has a stranger walked up and said, can you derive the radar equation for me? I really need it fast. It was one of our team members. First of all, um, we assume that we're going to uh, transmit some power level out in the form of these little pulses. And we're going to shape the pulses into a really sharply defined beam. So we're going to transmit power out, that's PT, and we're going to concentrate that energy in a, uh, in a beam uh, with some gain uh, 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 GT, where, where T stands for transmitter. Transmitter. Um, oh, uh, GT will be the gain will be the uh, gain of the uh, transmit, gain of the transmit antenna. And we'll come up to this. We'll sneak up on it. Okay, so um, P sub R, which is going to be equal to about 10 to the minus 14 watts, is going to be equal to, first of all, we're going to just work our way through this one, uh, one uh, term at a time. It's going to be proportional to the, to the transmit power that we can put out. So first of all, we'll start off with the, uh, with the transmit power, P of T. And that power is going to radiate out for some distance, and we'll, uh, and we'll just call it a distance R. And as the energy radiates out to a distance R, it's going to spread out on the surface of a sphere of radius R. And the surface of a sphere goes as 4 pi R squared. So the energy that we transmit is going to be diminished as a function of distance at the rate of 4 pi r squared, where r is the distance that's going out. But, as I just said, we're also concentrating the energy geometrically with an antenna gain, g sub t, um, and, and this is not decibel gain, this is just linear antenna gain. Um, so if, if, for example, we radiate over a hemisphere, we have a gain of, of 2. If we have uh, energy concentrated over a tenth of a sphere, a gain of 10, and so forth. So we'll multiply this by g of t. So the energy that reaches, and this now is the energy that reaches the target. The energy that reaches the target 
is a flux is going to be equal to the power we transmit multiplied by a spreading factor, 1 over 4 pi r squared, multiplied by the geometric gain of the antenna that we use to fire the energy out into space. By the way, if this were not directed at all um, in a preferred direction, if it were isotropic, then g sub t would be equal to 1, for example. Then the target, which looks something like this, might be a little airplane kind of a shape out here, really weird little airplane shape, um, <laughs> something that looks like this. Who knows what it looks like? This thing sees energy hitting it and reflects energy back out, and it does so with a certain efficiency that depends entirely upon the geometric and material characteristics of the object as well as its physical size. All of those behaviors are subsumed in a single uh, um, entity called the cross-section sigma, and it's sigma sub e, which is sigma effective, the effective cross-section. Sigma is not equal to the physical cross-section of most targets. Um, so the, the, the sigma sub e reflects the, <laughs> no pun intended, reflects the efficiency um, of reflection of the energy. Now this has units of square meters, or units of area, right. units of square meters, so sigma. Then this energy has to come back some distance are again back to the receiver and remember that we're assuming that we're running that we're going to build a monostatic radar so the distance out equals the distance back so this energy again spreads by a factor of 1 over 4 pi r squared but then r is measured from, from the where r is measured from the from the target back to the back to the radar um, back to the radar station here where it, where, it, where it originated. So we have to go R out and R back. We really, you really pay the price with the radar system. You lose 4 pi R squared twice. <laughs> yeah. Which means that this is going to come out to be an R to the fourth, unlike mm -hmm. a communication system that would classically run R squared. <laughs> and then we're going to receive this energy with an antenna that has a certain effective aperture, which again is measured in terms of area, square meters. In fact, here we have power. Here we have power per square meter. This is worth doing. Here we have power. Here we have power per square meter, power per unit area. Gain has no dimensions. Gain is just a geometric concentration factor. Then we multiply by the square meters of the target. So at this point, we're back to power. This is really a better name. <coughs> it would be just cross section. Or would be just cross section, right? Yeah. And then the efficiency is unitless. Exactly. The efficiency is unitless. And then, as this energy spreads back out, we're back to power per square meter. At this point, returning back to here, we'll multiply that by the effective aperture of our receiving antenna in square meters. And that brings us back to power in the receiver at that point. And so the radar equation becomes, erase this part, becomes P sub R is equal to uh, PT times GT times, I'll just call it sigma just to make it easy, times uh, the effective area of the, of the received antenna, which again is not necessarily the same as this physical cross section, divided by 16 pi squared uh, r to the fourth. Okay, <clears throat> so far so good. Uh, and we know um, that eventually we're going to put 10 to the minus 14 watts uh, in for p sub r. Now, um, let's think about what, the, what these other parameters need to look like for the radar that we're going to design. We want to find a target at some, at some maximum distance r. How far out do we want to go with an air search radar? Well, of course, there are radars that, that reach all the way out into um, uh, Earth orbit. Uh, there are radars, in fact, that bounce energy off of uh, the moon, Mars, Venus. But there is a problem for looking for things in the Earth's atmosphere. The problem is that the Earth has curvature, like so. And if we imagine that we position a radar uh, at a location like this on the Earth's surface, and that this radar has one of these beam shapes that looks like this, basically seen in cross sections rotating around like that, then the lowest altitude, the lowest height above the Earth's surface that this radar can see any target at all 
is going to increase as the as this distance r, this this factor r increases away from the radar. In other words, this is a dead zone in here. The radar can't see what's going on in here. You're missing air traffic in here. If we're flying under the radar, well, you can fly under the radar two ways. You can use terrain masking, in which you actually stay down behind hills and ridges to avoid the radar, or you can simply stay down below this critical height for long-range radar. We don't want this height to get overly large, even for an air traffic control radar, because obviously we don't want to miss more traffic than necessary. On the other hand, we don't want to make the radar's range any shorter than necessary. Well, how do we figure out what that height is going to be? Well, here's the height. We'll write the height as h. Here's the Earth's radius. Uh, something like that. There we go. Cap r, r sub Earth. Here's r sub Earth. This is, and this is a really handy little function to know for any application. Now, this is right angle, so we have a right triangle which has legs that are uh, the length of the radius of the Earth, the radius of the radar's coverage, and the height that is a dead zone where we can't see targets plus the radius of the Earth. So by geometry, we uh, have, we have, uh, let's see, r squared plus r, e. so we'll say r squared plus cap r for the radius of the Earth squared is equal to h plus r squared, the Pythagorean theorem, of course. Um, now, um, we'll say that this is equal to r times uh, 1 plus, and there's a reason I'm going to do this, 1 plus h over r, still quantity squared, I just pulled the r out, that's equal to r squared times 1 plus h over r squared. Now I'm going to use the binomial theorem, which says that 1 plus um, 1 plus x to the n is approximately equal to 1 plus nx if um, x is much, much less than 1. So this is approximately equal to now r squared times 1 plus 2h over r, which is equal to r squared plus 2 times r times h. And now, uh, oh, sorry about that r squared, yeah. Whoop, there we go, r squared, okay. Now, the two r squareds divide out, and the result that we get is that, um, the result that we get is that a little r squared is approximately equal to two times the radius of the earth times this, the height of this dead zone, um, which means that r is approximately equal to the square root of two times the Earth's radius multiplied by the square root of that height. Whoop, that height, like so, okay? And um, I won't go through the numbers right offhand, but I'll, but I'll tell you that if, um, if you want to know the radius in miles, statute miles, that's approximately equal to one point two, three times the square root of the height in feet, or if you want to get radius in <coughs> kilometers, that's approximately equal to 3.5 times the square root of the height in meters. Okay, like so. Uh, so if we work this out, it turns out that if the height is equal to about 11,000 feet here, and I'm going to do this in feet versus kilometers, which will confuse you even more, because altitudes for aircraft in the U.S. are usually done in feet, and, but I want to do the rest of this design problem in meters in um, uh, MKS units, then it turns out that the corresponding, dis the, the corresponding radius r is going to be equal to about 200 kilometers, 2 times 10 to the 5 meters. You can work out, you know, work these numbers out for yourself if you want to. Um, by the way, if you're flying an airborne radar at an altitude of, say, oh, around about 30,000, 35,000 feet altitude, the distance that you can see out to the Earth's horizon is going to be something over 200 miles, 220, 230 miles, um, which gives you some idea of what the, what the distance coverage is for an airborne radar at a given altitude, just, just working the problem in reverse. So, so 
The reason I did this was to show that if the, if the uh, range for our radar begins to get too much in excess of about 200 kilometers, we're going to end up in an excessive dead zone where we can't see anything happening. Some radars run up to about double this radius for air search functions, but see there, but then the uh, 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 coverage level where they're missing targets gets pretty large. So for our purposes, we'll set R equal to 200 uh, kilometers, which is 2 times 10 to the 5th meters. Okay, and we'll set uh, sigma, the cross section, equal to one, uh, I, I'm sorry, equal to a tenth of a square meter. This is not the same as a physical cross section of a target, um, but, but this is a good number to use. We'll set the effective aperture for the radar antenna equal to, let's say, 20 square meters. Um, and we're going we're gonna to keep PT and GT for the moment as a, just as a product. I'm not going to worry about those two at the moment. So, what should I erase? I will erase, everyone got this for how to, this is a, this is a fast and easy way to do it if you ever forget how. Um, just use the binomial theorem. I'll erase this part right here. That sigma is typical for what kind of target? Uh, something the size of maybe, of an airliner? Uh, certainly it'd be decent for something the size of a cruise missile, maybe even oh. something the size of a Cessna, depending on, and by the way, this, okay. the cross-section of targets, of course, depends upon well, the orientation sure. of a target, uh, right. something the oriented head on the beam. Right, the angle. But even something like a cruise missile might, a cruise missile headed straight at you might have a cross-section of a tenth of a square meter. Uh, de again, depending upon how it's built. Oh, and by the way, when people build stealth systems, all they're trying to do is reduce that number, and right. you can't make it zero. Right. <laughs> so nothing becomes invisible to radar. It's just a problem of reducing the cross-section sum. Plus, a lot of stealth uh, depends on um, uh, uh, psychological techniques to make people look the wrong way when they ought to be looking in a certain direction and reducing your cross-section. But, in any event, so we're going to say that the product of PT times GT which is the effective isotropic radiated power coming out of the radar. Um, this is the effective power that would be, have to be rated from the transmitter if the gain were equal to 1. For example, the product PT times GT is equal to this received power times 16 pi squared times r to the fourth uh, divided by uh, sigma times the effective aperture. Okay, so that's equal to now to put in the actual numbers that we decided we want to use, 10 to the minus 14 watts for the received power times 16 pi squared. Well, times 160. 160 round numbers. Yeah, I think it's like 158 if you really. But yeah, exactly. 4, 8, 6, uh, 2 times 10 to the fifth I should, is 16 times. That's 32. 1 point, right, 16 times 10 to the 20th, or 1.6 times 10 to the 21st. That's the r to the 4th. So here's pi r squared. Here's, uh, I'm sorry, uh, I mean, uh, here's 16 pi squared. 16 pi squared r to the 4th uh, divided by uh, 0.1 um, and divided by uh, 20. And let's see. Yeah, so that comes, okay, so that means that PT, oh, excuse me. So PT times GT is equal to 1.26 uh, times 10 to the 6 watts. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, 10 to the ninth. Yeah, sorry. 10 to the ninth. 10 to the ninth. Right. We have to generate. Yeah, we have to generate 1.26 <laughs> gigawatts in in the in the transmitted pulse, give or take. Um, check my numbers and make sure I'm right, but I I, I think I'm right about that. It's certainly it, it's certainly in the right order of magnitude. But remember, this is the product of PT times GT. We can build pretty easily at microwave frequencies a 30 dBi gain antenna, an antenna with 30 dB of gain over I, above isotropic. A 30 dB gain antenna. 30 dB relative to isotropic gain is <coughs> equal to, or implies, a linear gain factor of 1,000. And so, um, and so PT becomes 1.26 megawatts. If, if GT, if we build a 30 dB gain antenna, which is not unusual for a radar, 
Then, and you, now you see why you have to scale the radar so that you can get like 30 dB again. It's not just to isolate something physically at a given location in space, but also so you can actually get your transmit power down to some reasonable number. The power in the pulse is going to have to hit a peak level of one point, give or take, basically a megawatt. You're talking about megawatt power levels for, for a typical long-range air search radar. And I'll talk, it, it, you know, in a while I'll talk about a way to get that down by a factor of 10, but for now we've at 1.26 megawatts peak power coming out of the antenna However, you are looking at something like 1.26 gigawatts effective power coming out of the antenna at you, which is why after measuring radar, I was always zero. I have no hair left. Um, <laughs> it, but that's only when the pulse is but on. But that's only when the pulse is on. And then we'll look at what it takes. Right, exactly. Uh, P sub T. And so that is peak pulse uh, power. Okay. Now, the other parameters will come a little faster than this, but yeah, so now we know roughly uh, what we need to generate going out. Uh, for these kinds of parameters for our air search radar. Um, so, uh, go to the next board. <clears throat> and it all starts with KTB. It's great. Okay. Uh, let's continue this little design problem. Uh, the uh, dead the uh, dead zone where we can't see targets extends up to about 11,000 feet altitude, so that's not too bad. The um, antenna gain, antenna gain, is is about uh, 30 dB over isotropic, which which is a linear gain factor of a thousand geometrically. The uh, cross section of the target that we want to be able to see was about a tenth of a meter, a tenth of a square meter, about a tenth of a square meter. Um, the noise figure of the radar was on the order of 5 dB. The radar receiver bandwidth, and we'll hit that in a minute, was on the order of 1 megahertz. You'll see why in a moment. Uh, and let's see, what else did we have? Oh, and the, and the, and the effective aperture of the receive antenna uh, was about 20 square meters. Okay. And the uh, uh, power that we're trying to receive to just be able to kind of see a target out of the noise, receive power is on the order of 10 to the minus 14 watts. And all these factors together meant that the transmit power needs to be on the order of a megawatt. You know, we, we compute 1.26, but on the order of megawatt. So that's coming, that's not out of the antenna, that's a megawatt out of the transmitter going into the antenna. It's got to hit that one megawatt peak power peak power uh, every time it generates one of these little RF pulses. And of course, a real RF pulse is going to have thousands of cycles of RF energy in it, but I'm just drawing it this way. So the pulse looks like, kind of, looks like a little wave packet uh, traveling out in space. Okay, so now we've solved that problem. Now, um, how much uh, time do we need to allow from the time that we transmit one of these pulses to the time that we could get an echo back from a target maximum range, at which point we can then finally generate a second pulse to go out and look. Well, uh, speed of light divided by two. Right. Speed of light times delta t, the, this interval, is going to be equal to twice the radar's uh, radius. So delta t will be equal to 2r over the speed of light. Uh, and uh, that's two times the range, which is two times 10 to the fifth. Um, meters divided by 3 times 10 to the 8 uh, meters per second. And so that's equal to 4 thirds times 10 to the minus 3 seconds. The delta t, the interval that we have to wait before we can fire a second pulse, is going to be on the order, therefore, on, on the order of 1 millisecond, 1,000th of a second, 4 thirds. Again, we're, we're getting rough numbers here. So on the order of 1 millisecond. So now we know how long we have to wait between these pulses, and that is going to be an interval. Here's our other pulse. That's going to be an interval that's going to be on the order of one millisecond. Okay. And this is called the PRI, which is the pulse repetition uh, interval. That's just nomenclature that people use. They also talk about pulse repetition rate. The pulse repetition rate here would be one kilohertz because the pulse is 1,000 pulses per second. So that implies that the PRR is equal to one kilohertz. And you can actually listen to these. If you, if you demodulate the rate of pulse training as, you're, as, you're, as it's, as it's uh, 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 looking in your direction, you hear a whoop, it'll be a one kilohertz tone as it's coming around. Whoop, 
every time it comes around. If it's a long-range radar, longer than this, it'll go wah, wah, because the pulses are spaced further apart. And if it's a little fire control radar with a range of maybe a kilometer or a few kilometers, it'll go weep, 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 every time it comes because you're hearing the pulses really close together, and it might be putting out 10,000 pulses per second. So you hear a 10 kilohertz tone. So you might hear a 300 hertz tone for a long-range radar, a 1 kilohertz tone for the radar we're doing, and a 10 kilohertz tone for a really, really short-range uh, radar. Okay, so these are important numbers to have. So now we know how, how often we can emit a pulse. Uh, the next problem is how long should the pulses be? Well, we want to be able to distinguish between two targets that are separated by some little distance D out in space with pulses that are coming out like this, a pulse at a time. And I don't want to belabor the point except to say that the range resolution is on the order of, is approximately equal to, the pulse width divided by two, half the pulse width. Now, light travels at the rate of one foot per nanosecond. That's the great thing about the English system. It came out to be one foot per nanosecond. It's terrific. Um, so if we want to be able to resolve targets that are maybe something on the order of 500 feet apart in range, um, then that implies about one uh, thousand uh, nanoseconds for the pulse width, um, one thousand, yeah, which is a thousand nanoseconds. Nanoseconds is one microsecond. So a pulse pulse width on the order of a microsecond for an air search radar is not unusual. There will be variations. You'll see half a microsecond, three microseconds, and we'll see some other variations. But a typical pulse width is going to, in fact, be about on the order of a microsecond long. And so now we know what this length is. This length is going to be on the order of one microsecond. Now we know what the duty cycle of the radar is, because the duty cycle, duty cycle, which is equal to the pulse width divided by the pulse repetition interval, is going to be on the order of one microsecond for the pulse width divided by something on the order of one millisecond for the pulse repetition interval. That's equal to about 1 over 1,000, and uh, 10 log of, a thou of 1 over 1,000 is minus 30 dB. And so if people say a radar has a 30 dB duty cycle. That just means that the pulse width is about 1,000th of the pulse repetition interval. It also means that this peak power requirement that we have for a megawatt peak power in the pulses means that the power supply for the radar is only going to have to crank out about what? A kilowatt. Now, there are inefficiencies, so it's going to be a few kilowatts. But we can at least build a kilowatt or a few kilowatt power supply. So you're going to have a, f a power supply that is able to generate a few kilowatts of average power, which is going to be stored up into these little short pulses and fired out in really high power pulses that are spaced really widely apart. <laughs> and this is why the radar now we see operates 99.9% .9 of the time in a passive mode listening and only a tenth of a percent of the time in a high power mode firing out pulses. Fires a microsecond pulse out and then waits a thousand times longer for echoes and at the end of that time basically we fire another pulse and yes it is possible for a target to be beyond the maximum range of the radar and produce an echo return that comes back in after the second pulse was fired in which case we will see the target appear to not be really far away but appear to be really really close <laughs> so so that's a range ambiguity problem that you have to solve if you're designing a radar but that I'm not going to worry about that right now but but and and it, that can also be called a second time around return okay so now uh, what do we have left uh, duty cycle peak power uh, I'm going to circle these in green as I go. These are the key numbers. So peak power, uh, megawatt, uh, pulse repetition interval, uh, about a millisecond, pulse width on the order of one microsecond. Um, and we're getting, close, we're getting close to being finished with the radar design at this point. We know how long to make the pulses, how widely apart to space them, how much power we've got to generate. Um, now, let's look briefly, very, very, very briefly, and I'm going to extremely, I'm going to extremely oversimplify this problem. I'm going to way oversimplify this problem. Anyone who's a professional radar designer would kill me at this point. But it's the problem of how many pulses we need to echo back off a target in order to actually declare a target in the radar receiver. It turns out that the chances of basically seeing a target with a single echo pulse back, like we've been talking about up to this point, are not very good. Um, we, could, we could estimate, just for the fun of it, we could estimate that the chances are that we're not 
going to see a, I'll leave that sitting here. Leave this here. I'll fill in the rest of these params we just did. We said PT is going to be on the order of a megawatt. Uh, pulse width is going to be on the order of a microsecond. Pulse repetition interval is going to be on the order of a millisecond. Duty cycle is on the order of 1 over 1,000, which is minus 30 dB. Okay, got all those right there along with these other little design parameters right here. Um, oh, and remember again, GT is equal to 1,000, which is equal to 30 dB over isotropic. Okay, that's what we've designed for the radar so far. Um, the probability of detection uh, per pulse per pulse for the kind of radar that we're designing. Let's say, just for the sake of argument, let's say that the probability of detection, probability of detection is on the order of 10%. Uh, I've only got a 10% chance of seeing something if one pulse comes in. But let's suppose that we have an independent, and this, and this is where the radar designers would kill me, but it gets to the point I want to make. Let's suppose that we have an independent probability of finding a target if we fire a second pulse. We've also got a 10% chance of seeing with the second pulse, and the third pulse, and the fourth pulse, and the fifth pulse, and so on, and so on, and so on. Right, okay. So, what we have is a 10% chance of detection. That means that we have the uh, probability of a miss, the probability of a miss is equal to 0.9 uh, per pulse. So there's a 90% chance that we'll miss on the first pulse, and, and of course, um, this goes to the issue of, suppose that you're a uh, uh, going back and forth to the store and you've only got a 10% chance of getting killed every time you go to the store. But if you go to the score, store 20 times, what are the chances you survive all 20 trips? Well, not very good. Oh, as a wow, I'm great. 90% chance every time. Well, after 20 trips, you're, you're probably about dead. Um, because, um, because, of course, the uh, probability, um, the probability of, of missing um, n times is equal to um, 0.9 to the n to the to the nth. So the probability of detecting is equal to one minus the probability of missing, which is one minus 0.9 to the nth. And let's suppose that n is equal to uh, one and ten and twenty. then what's the probability of getting a detection? Yep, you get the idea. Okay, what's the probability of getting a detection? Well, the probability of getting a detection um, uh, here is only going to be 10% um, uh, if we fire off one. And, uh, oh, I actually did 10, 15, and 20. I'll do it this way, 10, 15, and 20. And I did the numbers in advance just to see what they came out to be. Uh, 65, 79, 88, 0 0.65, 0 0.79, and 0.88. Okay, so if, if, you, um, if you've only got, if you've got a 90% chance of surviving your trip to the store and back every time you go, and you go to the store um, one time, there's only a 10% chance you get killed. If you go to the store 10 times, there's a 65% chance you get killed. 15 times, there's a 79% chance, chance you get killed. 20 times, there's an 88% chance you get killed. So if you draw this out as a curve, what you see for the curve where we have probability of detection, which is like the probability of getting killed when you go to the store on our hypothetically dangerous trip, um, is going to be a curve that starts to look something like that. And you can generate a family of these curves for, uh, for uh, different uh, pulse probabilities. But it turns out that you start to really do well with the curve if you're in a range between about 10 to 20. Now, you can go more than 20, and you do keep getting an improvement, but the improvement doesn't go up all that fast if you go to more than 20, right? But if, you're, but if you're working down here at 1, the chances aren't good at all. So, when we design our radar, we want to be able to put 10 to 20 pulses on the target, and they call this painting. They want to paint the target with 10 or 20 pulses, and this is why. Basically, 10 to 20 is kind of a sweet spot between putting on enough pulses to get a reasonably good probability here that you're going to see a target, maybe 70 to 90 percent that you see a target, versus putting so many pulses on the target that you're basically wasting your time putting out a lot of pulses without getting much return on your money, <laughs> much return on your pulses. So, so this radar now, remember its uh, pulse repetition interval is about one millisecond. Let's suppose that we'll, uh, let's suppose that we want this radar 
Oh, to, uh, well, it'll be fairly thorough. We'll, actually, we can make it, well, we can make it easier to make it thorough. Let's, let's make the radar problem easy. Let's say I want to put 10 pulses out on the target. Kind of minimalist. Most radars put out more like 15 or 20, but we'll go for 10 pulses. Okay, that means that in this antenna beam that we're aiming out here toward the target, which is itself rotating around in space like this, which itself contains a set of radar pulses like this, we want to put within the, within the 3 dB beam width of the radar beam, we're going to put in about, give or take, 10 pulses. Okay, and again, I'm just going to do this to make the math easy. So put about 10 pulses in there. That means that when, we'll say that Steve's the target again. Here's my beam rotating around like this. My beam begins to hit Steve, and in the time that my beam goes across Steve, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now the beam is off Steve. I have 10 chances to see him, so if I had a 10% chance per target of seeing Steve, I've got a 65% chance I see him as my beam rotates over him. Not great, but, you know, maybe he's at long range and he's got a small cross section. I don't Who knows? So now we know that um, this 10 pulses is going to take a time interval that's on the order of 10 milliseconds. It's going to take on the order of 10 milliseconds to paint across him. And we know that the, the gain of the radar is about 30 dBi, which we have both so we can isolate the target relatively tightly in space and also so we can reduce the peak power out, uh, out of the transmitter itself. And so let's, oh, and the isolation in space is about equal to that 3 dB beam width, which is that 3 dB beam width, 3 dB beam width, given that it's a 30 dBi gain um, antenna, uh, for the reasons just given and that we want to isolate them rather tightly, it's going to be on the order of one degree. Now, you can work out the exact numbers, but it's on the order of a degree. One, one and a half, two degrees. But they don't like anything much bigger than really about one and a half degrees for the isolation. So, it takes 10 milliseconds, putting these two numbers together, it takes 10 milliseconds to scan one degree of azimuth for this radar. We can speed up the scan rate, but then that reduces the number of pulses. We can slow down the scan rate and get more pulses, but then it takes longer to do a complete orbit around and search this volume, and while we're looking over here, maybe somebody's sneaking up on us over here, so we don't want to take too long. So again, we have to do these balances and trade-offs in radar design. Well, if it takes 10 milliseconds per degree of azimuth, then it's going to take, th uh, then it's going to take 360 times uh, 10 milliseconds, and, a, and a, milli uh, a millisecond is 0 0.001, so 10 milliseconds is 0 0.01 seconds, in order to do one rotation of the radar, and so this implies 3.6 seconds per radar scan. So we're, so we're going to search 360 degrees every 3.6 seconds. If we want to boost the number of pulses up to 20, then the 3.6 seconds is going to become 7.2 seconds. Now, guess, guess what the rotation rate is for an FAA airport surveillance radar, which has about this range. They split the difference. It's 4.75 seconds. So they're putting about, about 15 pulses on a target. They balance, out, they balance those two factors out that way. So if you're looking, conversely, if we're looking at a radar that rotates 4, 5, 6, 7 seconds, it's got this kind of a range. We're going to see about 10 or 20 pulses in the beam and so forth. We can actually measure this time interval on a spectrum analyzer and oscilloscope. We'll get its exact azimuth resolution in space. All this will come back around to how we can spy on radars. Um, but basically, for the radar we're designing, we just said, okay, 3.6, we'll, we'll make it 4 seconds. So I'll put this up here. So scan rate is equal to 4 seconds. And that's also called the update rate. That's the rate at which you can update the position of a target. Every four seconds, you get an update. Boom, 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 boom. Make it five or seven seconds, make it 10 seconds. But that's the rate that you can update the uh, position of a target. And that's also how much time somebody has to sneak up on you if you're worried about somebody shooting a missile or something at you. Uh, 
they've got four or five seconds to try to sneak in on you before you're going to look back around in their direction again. Or if you're in a boat and the boat is moving on the surface of the water and there's a giant bridge in front of you, which you should be smart enough not to hit, <laughs> you're going to see the position of the bridge in front of you updated every four seconds. <laughs> how? No, okay. Hey, Frank. That, but, <laughs> yes. This may seem like a stupid question, yeah. but how come you can't have two radars going around? There are systems that do have two radars going around. That's been done. That's okay. been done. I've seen uh, pictures of Russian systems where they actually mounted two antennas and have them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can do it. <laughs> I think in the back look, they're kind of small. Right, though. and, and uh, I mean, obviously the antenna design gets a little more complicated, plus now you have to build two transmitters. and two. It's like having two radars in one, but you can do it, and I've seen it done. So now you can combine really long range with a really high prob probability of detection with a relatively fast update rate, because you've, you've got two antennas in two opposite directions going around. <laughs> it looks weird, but you can do it. Um, and that's the great thing about radar design. See, people, like I said, these are like works of art. Every radar represents somebody's vision for what they wanted to do. This is their <laughs> monument that they're going to build. This is how, this is the best way to find something on the surface of the water, something in space or in the air or whatever. So if we build a radar, does that make us a genius? If you build a radar, they will come, yes. So <laughs> with that said, with that said, there have been some really awful radars built, but I won't name them by name. <laughs> okay, so now we've, uh, let's see, I think we've actually worked our way pretty much down through all the parameters. Peak power, pulse rep rate, interval. Oh, one thing about the rep rate I, that I'm going to mention is uh, briefly. One, uh, so the, the one hertz uh, bandwidth. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That, uh, good, uh, good. Uh, uh, thanks. Yeah, okay, now, given that the pulse widths here are about a microsecond, so we can isolate objects to about 500 feet separation in space, then the matched, the matched filter bandwidth for the receiver, um, the receiver bandwidth should be about one over the pulse width get that from Fourier analysis, and that means one over a microsecond is about one megahertz. So the Yeah, thanks. So the receiver bandwidth is going to be on the order of a megahertz because the pulse width is on the order of a microsecond. And that takes us back to the KTB computation we did where we said, okay, KTB in a one hertz bandwidth is minus 174 dBm, add 60 for a one megahertz bandwidth, that's because we're going to... That's, that goes all the way back to how tightly we want to be able to separate objects in space with our radar in, in range. And, um, and so that becomes 1 over a microsecond, which is 1 megahertz. We add 5 dB to that, so we had minus 174 plus 60 plus 5 was minus 109 dBm. That became minus uh, 139 dBw. That became uh, P sub R, the minimum received power, P sub R, equal to about 10 to the minus 14 watts. And that, in turn, drove everything else. And that's another thing about radar design. All these factors sort of interact with each other, as you can see. So it's not a completely cut and dry problem to work it all out. But these are the kinds of numbers that you get uh, um, for, uh, for, for a typical radar design like this. Is it, yeah. Isn't it really ridiculous that 10 to the minus 14 watts? I mean, it <clears> sounds <throat> to me like, like nothing. I know, it's amazing. It's I mean, it's less than thermal, thermal I know. noise. Oh, well, when I go into the measurements that we do on radar emission spectra, I, uh, you know, I'm going to show that we'll measure things all the way from plus 30 dBm down to about minus, oh, down to minus 110 or so dBm. I mean, we'll, we'll get 100 mm, up. I can get up to 120, realistically 120 dB of dynamic range in the measurement on the radar emission spectrum. So we're actually going to measure from watts down to, you know, femtowatts basically, picowatts, femtowatts, down in there when we're doing the radar emission spectrum measurement too. I know it's amazing that you can go through these. Really, the key to the whole thing is log detection, that, that, that receivers can um, uh, have their uh, response range uh, turned into a logarithmic output. Because for the radar, we have a similar problem. The radar is going to see a really big target like a 747 at close range as a huge amount of energy in the receiver. A target which is a minimum cross section at maximum range is going to be very, very low, and the radar receiver has to work through orders of magnitude of receiver power. How does it do it? Without going into the details, they have a log detection scheme. The receiver works on a log range, not a linear range. It's the only way you can do it, unless you're really carefully controlling the whole radar problem, and then you can you know, constrain the dynamic range. But you generally can't do that for you know, generally for various types of search radars. Ah, oh, so any kind of interference or anything. Will radars are really susceptible to interference. It turns out that an interference to noise ratio that is the ratio of the interference level coming into a radar receiver divided by the radar receiver's internal noise. If that's equal to about minus 6 dB, that is if the interference is at one quarter of the power of the radar's internal noise. It's lower than radar's noise. It's 6 dB below the radar's noise. 
that begins to cause target loss. <laughs> nah. mm -hmm. and, the, and the best thing about it, the worst thing about it, the best thing, is that you can't tell you're losing targets. There's no strobing shown on the radar screen. We did a work on that here at ITS over a period of about five years, six years. You don't see any strobing. The, the target just fades out. <laughs> <laughs> that's not good because if you don't see a target on the radar, what does that mean? Well, I guess there's no target there. Yeah, I don't see anything or something here. So that's a real problem. Uh, but that's a simple problem uh, from what we're talking about here. But again, we go back to radars operate as these ultra high power systems a tenth of a percent of the time, and then 99.9% .9 of the time they're working as an extremely sensitive passive receivers that are scraping for every fraction of a dB they can get on the echo power. And at that, they're integrating the echo returns. And by the way, there are a lot of ways to actually do this integration. I really oversimplified the detection problem because I just want to get through it quickly just to sh by doing this kind of analysis. But, but basically, there are a lot of different schemes for integrating pulses that are coming back in the radar. Uh, now, one other thing that I'm going to mention in passing um, is that although we've been talking about transmitting simple RF pulses like this and then listening for the echo returns, um, there are schemes that are used to run radar pulses at lower peak power levels. Now, why would you want to run at a lower peak power level? Um, the problem is that here we have a radar pulse that looks like this. Okay, runs at a really high peak power level. Um, the types of systems that can generate these kinds of power levels are magnetrons, which are basically oscillators, high power microwave oscillators, uh, klystrons, traveling wave tubes, etc. The great thing, I think, the great thing about these is that these are all, these are all tube type systems. A lot of people think, think that vacuum tubes are no longer used. It's not true. A lot of high power radars use tubes to generate really high peak power levels. Again, remembering that we're trying to generate out of the transmitter something on the order of about a megawatt peak power in that pulse. Now, um, a problem can be that these tubes can be rather big and heavy, as can their power supplies. With that said, uh, even in World War II, magnetrons are being mounted in uh, relatively small pods in aircraft. But still, there are a variety of, of uh, reasons and applications for using not tubes, but solid state transmitters. Solid state transmitters consist typically of a whole set of modules that are set up like this that might operate 5 watts each. That's just order of magnitude. I mean, it can vary. Maybe 5 watts each. And the power out of these modules goes into a sort of power summation circuit, which then produces some reasonably high power pulse coming out. But uh, it's difficult to, it's not really even possible to hit a megawatt of peak power out of a solid state transmitter even if you gang up a lot of these. Oh, and, there, and there's another reason to use these. Other, other than the fact that they're solid state, which means you don't deal with some of the mechanical problems of tubes, um, and the fact that they can be relatively small and light, is, is the fact that if you lose a couple of these, if they fail, you still, you still have the majority of your available transmit power uh, coming out of the radar. So they, they, they fail softly, they, they, they fail gently. Uh, there are some reasons why you might like that. But still, the problem becomes that the peak power that you're generating out of this is typically on the order of one-tenth of the peak power that's available from a tube. So you want to build a solid state radar, uh, everything's great except you, you're, about a, you're, you're about an order of magnitude down on the power you need to get out of this thing to make it, to make it work well. <clears throat> what can we do? Okay, here's the key. You can build radar this way, and the key is that whereas with the tube radar you generate a pulse that has an envelope that looks like this, imagine all the RF energy oscillating inside this envelope. For the solid state radar, you come up to one tenth of the power, but you stretch the pulse out to ten times the width at one tenth the power. One tenth the power. One tenth the peak power. 
So here's our here's our beautiful here's our beautiful high power tube transmission, and here's our weekly um, solid state transmission. What's equivalent between the two pulses is the amount of energy in the pulse. A tenth the power for ten times the length of time is the same equivalent energy. It turns out that in terms of the radar design, that's all that counts to get the same amount of energy on the target. So you can run a pulse at a tenth the power for ten times longer, but what happened? Ah, we lost our range resolution. Ah. Okay, what do we do about that? What we do about that is to modulate the RF energy inside the pulse in such a way that when the pulse comes back into the receiver, we can demodulate that energy to, in effect, compress the pulse in time and get our range resolution back out. Now, given um, that we're already modulating the amplitude of the waveform uh, in terms of the envelope, what two degrees of freedom are left to, that we can modulate inside the pulse? Frequency and phase. We can modulate either or both of those. Typically, they only modulate one. But So, for example, we can fire a pulse out that starts off in time at a low frequency, which I'm going to draw like this, and which gets higher and higher and higher and higher and higher, and higher and like that as the, as the pulse runs in time. So, this is an FM'd pulse, FM'd pulse, which is also called chirped. And the reason it's chirped is if you demodulate and listen to it orally, at least as far as I know, because this is what I hear, I hear it go whip, whip, whip. Sounds like a bird chirping. I'm not a very good bird, That's but a chirp up. sounds like a bird. Yeah. And you hear it go <laughs> <laughs> if it's chirping, chirping down or whip, <laughs> whip if it's chirping up. And so you can draw this. Yeah, I know. It, 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 I, I'm not going to try to become a bird. But we can draw this as a time versus frequency. And this pulse will actually uh, do this as it runs the frequency will go up in time and then the pulse cuts itself off and then we wait for the pulse interval uh, to occur and then we do it again. Now, in the receiver, we have delay circuitry that, ha that forces low frequency energy to move more slowly than high frequency energy and so in the receiver, as the low frequency part of the pulse comes in, it gets slowed down, the high frequency of the part of the pulse moves faster, speeds up and catches up to it and the pulse literally compresses itself in the receiver and we get the range resolution back out. So. So, um, so this is frequency pulse compression, pulse compression, and you'll see this for radars as a so-called compression ratio, which is the ratio between the actual physical length of the pulse and the effective length of the pulse that comes out of the receiver. And if we do all this right, of course, we'll compress this pulse, this long FM pulse that got transmitted, into a really nice short pulse again in the receiver. The other way that we can handle the pulse problem is to modulate phase. And we can either have a continuous phase modulation, or we can break the pulse up into so-called chips, phase chips. And we can modulate these chips between 0 and pi, and pi, and pi, and 0, 0, and pi, and 0. And these become like 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, and so forth. And there are mathematical codes that can be used where we're changing the phase in the pulse as it's being transmitted. And again, in the receiver, we can, we can process on phase to get an effective pulse without that is about equal to the length of one of the phase chips. A popular set of codes to use are so-called Barker codes, um, named after the mathematician Barker, which have 13, <laughs> which have 13 chips in them. <laughs> there's also a, a process for quadrature phase keying in the pulse, and there's also a, pro a process for continuous phase variation, which is minimum shift keying, MSK. So radar designers get into all this, but suffice to say that the problem of compressing radar pulses is really the problem of making the radar work functionally with really long pulses that have to be compressed in the receiver to get an effective short pulse within the receiver to resolve the range resolution. And although there are a number of reasons for doing this, one of the, big, one of the biggest reasons is if people are using transmitters that can only achieve low peak power levels. Um, so, uh, so some of the more old, old, old line, old style radar designers say basically they hate this and they really like tubes because they just generate a lot of power and they get a short pulse out. Also, we have discovered that sometimes radars produce less interference into other radars if they, in fact, run with really high power pulses that are really short. Sometimes, even if a pulse is a low power, this length can cause other radars to not be able to reject its pulses as interference, whereas even if a pulse is really high power, if it's short enough, a lot of radar receivers can process this out by doing coherent processing um, on pulse returns. So ironically, it's not always better to run low power to avoid interference. For radars, it can be better to run high power with really short pulses to avoid interference, at least into other radar receivers. 
there are there is the problem of communication receivers, but radar people don't care about them. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least not the ones I've met. <laughs> there is no problem in spectrum management that cannot be solved with more power. <laughs> 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 Power yeah, possible. with the, all the power, all the power, all the power they can get, or maybe with their input. Okay, so one final last little thing to note, if you're looking at a radar emission is that you may, when you look at a radar emission in time, you may not, not necessarily see a set of pulses in time coming out of the radar that are exactly evenly spaced, which is the kind of radar we've designed up to this point, where the spacing between the pulses would be something on the order of uh, one millisecond. Uh, radar returns can also be used to process for the velocity of a target by measuring Doppler shift on a pulse-to-pulse -pulse basis. The radar sees the Doppler shift not actually as a frequency shift, but rather as a phase shift, because we're talking about very, very, very small amounts of variation. If, however, you're doing this kind of, if you're doing Doppler uh, processing on the returns, which is really useful for air search radars for two reasons. One is to tell what the actual loss of a target is. The second is to eliminate things on the plan position indicator that aren't moving at all. You can actually set a minimum threshold for the Doppler processing that says if anything is, has less than a certain amount of phase shift in the receiver, it must be going below a certain speed and it's not a target I care about and I suppress it on the radar display. But, 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 when you do this, you will discover that you have certain velocities in space for targets that correspond to the spacing between the radar pulses in time. In this case, the radar spacing is one, uh, or the radar of the pulses is, is one kilohertz. At, at velocities, at velocities that cause phase shifts that are, that are equivalent to, a, to, to, this, to this one kilohertz um, pulse repetition interval, you won't see your targets. These are called blind speeds. And this means the targets at certain magical speeds are going to disappear, and they'll be and they'll be integral multiples of each other. So, in order to eliminate the blind speed problem in a radar that's doing Doppler processing, what they do instead of putting out pulses at a fixed interval is they put out pulses with an interval which changes from pulse to pulse. And I'll draw it like this. Let's see. We'll make the next pulse a little out from that. Draw the next pulse a little out from that, and th and this set of pulses is now referred to as staggered. Blah, staggered. Staggered. And that means that delta T1 right here, here's delta T1, delta T2, delta T3. We've got four pulses, so three intervals. Delta T1, delta T2, and delta T3 are not, are not, any kind of integral multiples or half multiples of each other. Um, so if this is 1, this might be 1.1, 1 .1, and this might be an interval of 1.15. 1 1 millisecond, 1.1 milliseconds, 1.15 milliseconds maybe. You can vary it. By staggering the pulses, they eliminate the blind speed problems. Conversely, if we're looking at a radar emission and we see that the pulses are not evenly spaced, but rather have this kind of a stagger sequence between them, which will, by the way, eventually repeat. The stagger sequence will eventually repeat over here. But we make the stagger sequence repeat at a sufficiently long interval that anything that would have a blind speed would have to have that speed that, at, at, a, at a value that represents the um, that represents the product of these three numbers, and the speed would be so high that there's nothing in the air or nothing on the water, whatever it is we're looking at, that could possibly go that fast. <laughs> so you just push these out. You'll, you'll see uh, uh, three pulses, that's a three stagger. You'll see four pulses, that's a four stagger. They never, I've never seen anything go over about a four stagger, because by that time, the blind speeds that they have to worry about are so high that not even an SR-71 is going that fast, so they don't have to worry about it at that point. But conversely, if we see staggering going on, then we know that they must be doing Doppler processing with the radar, which is also called moving target indicator, because anything that shows up on the screen, anything that shows up on the plan position indicator for this type of radar, say stuff in here, must actually be moving. It's not so they so they lose the so-called clutter uh, features that would show up otherwise. So just something to note note there. And I think with that we've got the radar processing.
done, and uh, I'll just show you some pictures. I'll ask for questions and then show you pictures of some interesting representative radars, uh, just so you know what they look like. Um, any questions at this point? Monsters, because uh, first of all, the size of the antenna, the cooling systems associated. With right. Some of these radars become really, really big. In fact, we'll look at radars that range in size. Of course, the very smallest radars you'll see will be police speed guns, which don't even get distance information, but they do get FM information mm -hmm. back. They transmit a continuous wave, but they're little small things. Um, up through maritime radars, which really the size, and we'll see this in a minute, the size of maritime radars like this big. Uh, with an antenna that might be six to eight to nine feet long, uh, going and then running all the way on up to um, running all the way up to a ten-story tall building. Now, Frank, do the um, maritime radars have the clutter reduction feature in them? Or? Some do. Some okay. maritime radars have some clutter reduction mm -hmm. uh, features. The radar designers try all kinds of different things to uh, uh, to uh, make the radars go to, to to make them work well. And in fact, I'll show you some pictures here now. Just I'm sorry, I'll show you. Some all right, so. Just a quick introduction here to some radar types. Um, and I'm just going to do this with pictures. Uh, we'll look briefly at uh, long range and short range air search. What we basically just designed was would be considered a relatively short or maybe, maybe medium range air search radar. Then long range surveillance, maritime, terrestrial weather surveillance, airborne, and so forth. So just to start off, this is a typical view inside a radar installation. This was ITS equipment that we were using for this particular job. But everything back in these racks, including the big scope here, is. Um, is, is part of the long-range radar installation. This is a planned position indicator. Typically at a radar station, they're not doing air traffic control, but they do yet, but they do have the PPI scope set up so that they can monitor the health of the radar. They can tell if it, you know, things seem to be working right or not. This is more of the interior of kind of a typical long-range air at surveillance radar station. Uh, remember that I said that, the, that these long-range radars typically are two-dimensional, range and direction, but not altitude. There's an entirely separate system called the beacon transponder system that aircraft use, which encodes the aircraft's altitude from the barometric, barometric, not GPS, barometric altimeter inside the aircraft, mm -hmm. and transmits that information back when interrogated uh, from the radar station. And so some of these racks are devoted to nothing but the beacon interrogator and the beacon res uh, responder. And that's a completely electrically separate system from the radar. It's just co-located because it makes so sense to the two scans together. a separate together. receiver antenna. Te and a separate receiver antenna. But lined up with the other but one so it knows where exactly. it is. Exactly. And we'll see that. In fact, we'll see that in just a second. Exactly. Exactly, Steve. Again, a typical view. In this, this is a this is a radar where the transmitter tube, a big claystron, is right back here behind these guys. We have the transmitter racks. We have uh, various solid state cars, and we've also got a got an entire receiver system built in. <coughs> a view at the at some of the typical waveguide waveguide plumbing running through a through a radar. A lot of these air route radars have two frequencies: one radiating and one going into a dummy load that's on what they call hot standby, so they can literally switch on moment's notice if they lose one frequency. So you double right, right off the bat, you double the transmitter, uh, and you double all the all these weird waveguide runs. <laughs> Look at this. Um, they're, they're guys who will spend their lives just working in one of these radar stations, um, but boy, do they know the radar. They didn't want him back in there after that. <laughs> Very delicate instruments. <laughs> uh, this is just one of the historical notes that we had here, I guess, that, that we've transferred to the Historical Electronics Museum in Maryland. This is a German radar from World War II called a Würzburg. This is a parabolic dish that was built to operate with high gain at 600 megahertz, a really low frequency, so a really big dish. But they would slew these dishes around to try to direct anti-aircraft fire. And the thing is, it's, it's like a work of art the way it's built. It's like it's built like a dirigible or an aircraft. I've never seen anything like it. It's the weirdest thing. And uh, we used these uh, in the Department of Commerce, uh, specifically NIST used them over the years after World War II, to uh, track the sun across the sky to make early solar noise measurements. They had three of these painted red, white, and blue, and one of them actually had bullet holes in it. Two of them were shoved off a cliff, but this one survived, uh, to tell the tale. Now, here is the kind of antenna that we would put on the radar that we just designed. This radar produces a very narrow beam in this direction, a degree or so wide in this direction, but produces a vertical beam that's rather wide, several degrees, degrees wide vertically. The shape of the beam is a cosecant squared function. Um, it's got two feeds up here for uh, the, that are used for both transmitting and receiving pulses. Here are the little sections of waveguide going right up to the, to, the, to the two feeds right here. This is an ASR-9, Airport Surveillance Radar Model 9. Um, uses, if I recall correctly, a claystron. Now, to go to the beacon, 
The beacon transponder system sits here. Uh, That's an entirely electrically separate system that has nothing to do with radar other than the beacon also isolates targets in azimuth based upon having a very, very narrow beam width this way and we don't ca and, and, and again having a wide beam width this way, but the beacon transmits a coded signal at 1,030 megahertz. An aircraft transponder picks up that signal at 1,030 megahertz and responds at 1,090 megahertz, hence the term 1030, 1090. That contains both the IDENT information for the aircraft, which the pilot, as I say, squawks by dialing in a combination of numbers in the cockpit, it could be like 7725. Four and digits, zero through seven. Zero through seven, and so they're using three bits. And um, uh, the uh, aircraft's altimeter, which runs barometrically, encodes its information and transmits that information back along with the IDENT. So as a pilot is approaching an airport, they'll say something like, Jeffco Tower, this is Cessna 7642 Gulf, five miles southeast to land with, with information delta, which is recorded information. The tower uh, may call back and say, Roger 42 Gulf, squawk 7725 and IDENT, at which point the pilot dials in 7725, it's an IDENT button. Now, on the radar plan position indicator, they not only see the raw return, which shows up as a box, they also see the beacon return, which shows up as an X in the box, along with 7725, which is the IDENT, and the altitude, which otherwise you wouldn't get out of the system. And even if you could, so-called three-dimensional radars aren't sufficiently good in, in elevation resolution to allow air traffic control functions to be done that way. And everybody uses, incidentally, barometric encoding so that everybody will run off the same isotherms. If some people use GPS encoding, you'd have a problem because GPS altitudes aren't the same as barometric altitudes. And, air, and, and airplanes flying at a constant barometric altitude will, will typically fly at a varying altitude above ground level because the um, uh, isobars in the atmosphere vary uh, horizontally across distances. I love this shot. It took me like five minutes of shooting, 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 <laughs> <laughs> so I could show, so I could show what the cross section is of this antenna, and show the two um, feeds here, and show the beacon antenna. So two completely electrically separate systems running on the radar. Uh, this is the so-called primary radar. This is the so-called secondary radar or beacon. Although typically a lot of air traffic control really is done off of this because they get three-dimensional information off the beacon, but only two-dimensional information off the skin return. On the other hand, even if your beacon breaks or you turn it off, this still works. Up until September 11th, there had been a decision to turn off the long-range radars in the U.S. and run beacon only on everything. After September 11th, when one of the plane's uh, uh, hijackers turned off the beacon, people went, oh, right. So now we're keeping <laughs> the long-range radars running, but the FAA has handed over the cost of running radars to the Department of Defense. So they have FAA people working at the long-range sites, but they're paid on the DOD's nickel. <laughs> But up to that point, they were only up to, up to that point, up to 2001, they were only going to maintain long range radars on the East Coast, the West Coast, the Gulf Coast, uh, the uh, Canadian uh, line, the Mexican line, and Alaska, Hawaii, and Guam, and Samoa, and the Virgin Islands. They weren't going to run the long range radars inside the U.S. Here's, here's a, a, another thing they do with radars. They'll often put these radars up on a high tower. This is to get them up above all of this junk down here buildings, trees, cars, you name it which produce what are called clutter returns in the radar, which is a bunch of unwanted reflection energy. Plus, these radars are running moving target indicator. They're doing Doppler processing, which again helps to get rid of clutter returns from all this junk clutter uh, down here um, near the radar. Um, this gives you a sense of what the scale you're saying. We're, we're saying 20 square meters. Although the electrical aperture isn't quite the same as the, as the physical aperture, it's similar for this kind of antenna. They, they told me this radar was turned off um, ah. when I got up on it. Was it rotating? Uh, yeah, actually it was. It's, it's a kick. Oh, and by the way, this radar does rotate at 4.7 seconds per rotation, which did you, remember did you hang splits on? the difference. <laughs> yeah, right. Just, you just hang on and around. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like an amusement park ride. Right? It's great. <laughs> Multi-million dollar amusement park ride. Right? Cool. And again, this radar is actually up on a high tower, which is itself up on top of a high hill to minimize clutter returns. How much is this stuff like that? Oh, uh, tens of millions. I know of one Navy radar, which is a three-dimensional long-range air search radar, which costs $300, $300 million per copy. These radars are relatively cheap. They're only a few million dollars per copy, um, comparatively speaking. This is a long-range um, L-band, meaning that it runs about 1,300 megahertz, air search radar, 
which is basically the same antenna as the TPS-1 from World War II and the Arcer-1, which is still being run a um, lot of places uh, in the United States. This particular radar was part of a Nike anti-aircraft missile system that was supposed to provide some kind of a defensive shield against Russian planes back in the 1950s. But a radar is a radar, and again, you can tell from the width of the antenna, which is really wide, that it produces a very narrow beam in azimuth, but from the height of the antenna, which is relatively narrow, that the beam in elevation is like this. It's a really, it's a really wide elevation beam and a really narrow beam in azimuth. So these radars could only be used to get the range and the direction to a target. They had to have additional radars at each Nike site to get more information like what the altitude of the targets was. Um, but the reason I have this here is that this, this radar is very, this radar antenna is very similar to other long range L band radar antennas. And these are typically running at about double the radius, about uh, double the search radius of one of these. So where these rotate every 4.75 seconds, these typically rotate every 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. So they have a much, they have, they've got half the update rate. The pulse repetition interval is twice as long. The pulse widths are somewhat longer, but, uh, they're, but, but they work out at twice the range. But the dead zone, where they can't see between the bottom of the beam and the Earth's surface, you know, becomes correspondingly larger um, according to the square root equation. Oftentimes, those kinds of antennas will be seen inside a bubble like this. Um, they put the bubbles up just for weather protection and to prevent uh, effects with wind loading. Um, but with that said, there are a lot of other radar antennas that, that are used for long-range air search, um, other than this style, which has the feed out here illuminating this um, uh, parabolic shape. Um, <coughs> these kinds of radars are phased arrays, where they build a lot of amplifiers, uh, in some cases right into the radar's surface, or other times they'll feed a waveguide that runs up the radar's uh, surface. And this radar, although it rotates mechanically about once every 10 seconds, again doing long range air search, actually can scan a beam from low in elevation to high in elevation. So it's roop, 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 roop like that. So it does get somewhat of a 3D effect as it's rotating. But as I said, the, the search problem becomes more complicated and the um, the uh, um, uh, search times can typically get a little longer and so on and so forth. This antenna you'll notice is actually sitting on a trailer that's actually been pulled in under this bubble. So this would be some kind of a transportable radar, a TPS style radar. Um, here's another uh, um, uh, TPS uh, style radar and this one actually has amplifiers built in these rows and they phase these amplifiers with each other again to produce a beam that can scan vertically bloop, like that, bloop, like that, bloop, like that, as the radar is rotating. And, but notice again, this radar has a beacon antenna sitting up here at the top. So, so you can tell just by looking at it that they're running beacon interrogations as well as running skin tracking on this, on this radar. And this is another transportable unit that can be folded up and towed around on trailer and then set up again with a power generator and everything. There's a side view that shows how the amplifiers are arranged in the rows. Obviously this kind of antenna is a, is a lot more expensive than the, than the uh, cheaper, than simpler antennas. And in a certain sense, they built the whole transmitter and receiver right into the antenna here. Now, with that said, there's still a lot of receiver and transmitter circuitry that's not in the antenna, but, but they built a lot of the functionality right into the antenna. Here's an interesting one. This is a long-range air search radar, uh, which has a gigantic parabolic feed that you can't see because I'm standing on it in the picture up at the top of the bubble, and I'm looking down. And here, they've built a vast array of solid state modules into the feed. And this radar doesn't run at a megawatt, it runs at about a kilowatt out of this array of solid state modules which are running pulses that are 10 <coughs> times longer than a conventional pulse and they're doing pulse compression techniques in order to then get the range resolution back out. So here uh, is yet another approach to building a long range radar. And here's the beacon antenna no longer positioned at the top of the parabolic reflector because it turns out that that makes the whole assembly literally too high and too big, but rather now literally bolted on to the front of the feed. So again, here you get to see how every radar designer has their own little approach to the way they want to solve the problem. Um, and uh, I've forgotten how many I've forgotten how many solid state elements this is, but it's it's quite a few. Here's another view of the feed. Um, all these little solid state elements built right onto the feed. They're, tran they're, they're phased with each other and they're transmitting energy up to the big parabolic reflector that's up here out of the picture. And then that energy is radiating out, radiating out, and then these turn into a receiver array that brings the energy back in and then it gets processed. And again, here's the beacon antenna that's spinning around on the front of the feed. 
I think the I think the parabolic reflector on this, if I remember correctly, was about 40 feet tall. But there's a ladder that goes up the back of it so you can climb it. There's the back of that feed, so you can see how they have to feed every element separately and they have to phase them all together. But if they lose one or two elements, they don't uh, suffer any, any appreciable loss in the radar's performance level. So this is an air defense radar. Uh, use it uh, both air defense and air traffic control, both as it turns out. Uh, shared. I, good question. Yeah, the question is, how does it cool? How has it cooled? I don't know. That's a good question. I'm not sure how they do the cooling. Water or air? Uh, I don't. I don't think water. I, I, it, some kind of air cooling, I think, on that one. This is a radar antenna, um, which consists a of, of you know, a lot of energy. <laughs> and and here's one that consists of a waveguide. Here's here's the transmitter. The transmitter feeds a waveguide that runs up in here. Then the waveguide comes along in back. Then the waveguide bends, and then it bends, and it bends again, and then you have waveguide running along here. And if you look really close, you can see little slots cut. Slot, 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 slot. It's a slotted array waveguide, and, it, and this thing snakes back and forth. So this is a serpentine waveguide with all these slots cut into it, little cooling fins off on the end. And um, uh, this is yet another, basically it's yet another way of forming a beam, and then the radar antenna itself, again, rotates mechanically. And uh, I think this one runs at about uh, L-band. This is an antenna that you can see at the Historical Electronics Museum in Maryland. So uh, this, was a, th th this was part of the old Hawk anti-aircraft system, homing all the way killed, it allegedly stood for. But the old Hawk system, and this again is a two-dimensional search radar. So you have to have more radars ganged up with this in an anti-aircraft or an air defense system if you want to get full three-dimensional information on your targets, unless you can get them to transmit transponder beacon replies for you. Um, well, you never know, it might be worth a try. You might fall for it. I'm not falling for that trick again. <laughs> Won't fall for that trick twice. This is a Navy radar. This is the SPS-48. And again, this radar um, rotates mechanically, but forms a beam in three dimensions as a function of frequency. And we can see the serpentine characteristic of the wave guy off on the side of the plate. If you go to any naval base, you'll see these radars on all the big ships. The aircraft carriers and stuff are all carrying these. Um, in fact, if you listen to Navy communications, you'll, you'll even be listening to a movie or something. Someone's talking, you hear this, Mow. Every 10 seconds, you hear the Mow. That's that's electromagnetic interference from the radar getting into the ship's comm system. You'll, you'll actually hear the womp every 10 seconds as they're talking on the radio. And you, and you look in the back and you can see this antenna rotating around synchronously with it. It's really great. <laughs> um, and then uh, this is the Navy's Aegis, or so-called SPY-1. SPY stands for Shipborne Radar, and the Y is like general purpose. It could have been the SPQ, but for some reason they made it the SPY. SPY-1 radar. Uh, which consists of, of an array of elements that are built in behind this uh, flat uh, panel. And these are carried on Ticonderoga-class cruisers and on Burke-class destroyers. And on the cruisers and the destroyers, you'll see four of these antennas built onto the ship. Each of these antennas provides 90-degree quadrant coverage around the ship, so they get a full 360 degrees of coverage by building four of these into the, into the ship. The last time I looked at this, um, don't quote me exactly, but the last time I looked at this, the quoted number on the cost for this radar in, in, in the open source literature is like $300 million. So these are not cheap radars to build. Um, this is an airborne radar that operates at long range. This is what's called a AWACS, Airborne Warning and Control System Radar, operated by the US Air Force. The Navy operates one uh, on little, small, turboprop-powered airplanes, relatively small, turboprop-powered planes. And that system is called the Hawkeye system. But this is the uh, Air Force system. And this radar rotates mechanically. And then they do all kinds of fascinating things in, in terms of what they do with the beam. Uh, that comes out of this radar and the kind of processing on the returns that they get back. But the rest of the airplane inside is devoted entirely to uh, transmitting high power pulses and then receiving the echoes. And this, these radars, according to the open source literature, you know, are used for air to air, air to ground, tracking and surveillance of all kinds of different sorts of targets. So um, this is, this is a, 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 a transportable radar search model 78, TPS 78, built by Northrop Grumman, um, sitting with one of our measurement vehicles. And uh, you can see how this is transportable. There's a shelter over here that has the transmitter, the receiver, the power supply, and so forth built into it. And this thing, and again, this antenna rotates, and you can see they've got interesting things going on with the waveguide over here on the side. <coughs> Typically, any of these radars are going to be paired up with beacon transponder systems. I don't see a beacon transponder antenna on this radar, but typically you'll see all these paired up. This is, this is an, an all solid state, all electronic radar, no moving parts, 
all the beam scanning is done electrically around the radar, and this is the kind of radar that you would mount on, on the dorsal, on the back surface of, of, um, of a large airplane, <laughs> basically. This is a maritime surface search radar. Um, except for the display unit that a person on a boat would use, the entire radar is built right in here. The transmitter and the receiver are both built in here. Um, it feeds waveguide through a rotary joint right here, and then the antenna itself is a so-called slotted array, um, which is an empty end of itself that I won't go into right now, but this radar rotates in azimuth. It produces a beam shape, which is very narrow in azimuth, relatively wide in elevation, but which is actually slanted a little bit below horizontal. So the beam shape comes out and kind of down like that, and then back up like this. It's like a cosecant squared air search beam flipped upside down because it's supposed to look at things on the surface of the water. With that said, I have seen airplanes with radars like this. If, if the airplane's in the right geometry, you can actually see a plane flying around out there because you get enough energy up here in the upper part of the beam. Um, this is the inside of a typical maritime surface search radar. A lot of these are built in Japan, even if they're sold by various other manufacturers, so you open up and you see Japanese uh, characters on it. Here's the gear that's used to actually turn the antenna. Um, and you can see it's, it's, it's a really compact little transmitter receiver unit. These radars use magnetrons. Magnetrons are great. So again, tubes are still very much out there. Radar like this might transmit 10 or 15 kilowatts peak power out of the transmitter. And again, the antenna, uh, the gain of the antenna beam is on the order of give or take 30 dB. You know, 28 dB, 33 dB, but on the order of on the order of 30 dB. This is an OSM engineer. Um, and we were lifting a bucket of tools up because we were coupling interference signals into this radar uh, at a, a Coast Guard station. Here's another maritime surface, sur surface search radar, a little uh, bigger physically, uh, indicating that it's working at a lower frequency band. Um, this radar is working at X band at about 9 gigahertz. This radar is working down at S band, down around about 3 gigahertz or so. Um, Insurance and maritime rules generally require that any ships over a certain size carry not one, incidentally, but two radars for surface search. Typically, you'll see one of these spinning really fast and one of these spinning a little bit slower on the ship so that they have redundancy so that they can't possibly do something like run into a giant bridge in a bay. <laughs> <laughs> and yet, <laughs> uh, here's yet another maritime. So these are, these are just ubiquitous. You know, you go to any marina, you'll see lots of these radars. Here's a, here's a little radar that, that operates with a patch array, little, little uh, electrical patches etched onto a circuit board, and so the thing spins mechanically. Yet, yet another example of how people come up with all kinds of different solutions to solving the radar problem. When we talk about clutter, this is clutter on a radar display. This is what you really don't want. Uh, you want to suppress this. One way to suppress this is to raise the threshold of your detection so you don't see the clutter, but then, of course, a really small target could disappear, so there's no free lunch. So, again, this is why people do things to uh, try to get rid of clutter otherwise. Now, weather surveillance, we haven't even talked about weather surveillance. Suffice to say that when it comes to observing weather phenomena, you're no longer looking at discrete targets like boats and airplanes. Now you're looking at these really broad, continuous uh, phenomena, and it's no longer a problem of just finding an, an, an azimuth and a uh, and a distance and even an elevation angle. Now you want to do processing to get wind speeds, look at precipitation, look at hook echoes from phenomena like tornadoes, look at phenomena like wind shear, microbursts. And this is where I think the future really lies with a lot of radar development. It turns out that there is a lot more information in a radar echo than just the distance out and back from a target. There's an immense amount of information. And signal processing on returns is key to pulling that information out. So these radars, this is a NEXRAD, Next Generation Weather Radar, a NEXRAD radar that's the mainstay for the uh, National Weather Service and for NOAA. These radars are running with basically the same transmitter and the same antenna, which we'll see in a second inside the bubble for, I don't know, 20 or 25 years now. But, but, with that said, they have continuously upgraded the data processing on the on the software side on the receiver and they keep pulling more and more and more and more and more information out of the echo returns. They basically take out higher and higher moments. They've got the first and second and third order moments um, of information that they pull out of these returns. And I personally suspect that we have a long way to go because porpoises, dolphins, and beluga whales uh, can, can sense things such as the difference between a dime and a penny dropped into a a swimming pool at a distance of 100 meters, or um, dolphins and porpoises at least have been documented being able to tell the difference between a dime and a penny that have been buried up to a foot below the surface of the of the of the of the bottom area 
that is buried down into a foot of mud, they can tell the difference. Now, they've been working on the evolution problem for signal processing for about 50 to 55 million years, ever since the Eocene. <laughs> they can do amazing things. I don't think we're even coming close to what we can process out of radar returns. That echo energy contains an immense amount of information. So all these other radars we've been looking at up to this point, these things, from, from the standpoint of a beluga whale or a porpoise, are just pathetic. <laughs> it's like a blind man groping in the dark, as far as they'd be concerned. They pull out a lot of, but the weather service is getting close. Inside the next rat bubble, this is what you see, a giant parabolic antenna, which is scanned in a giant conical scan pattern. It takes them 10 minutes, or a little over 10 minutes, to do one complete volume scan, because they're using a pencil beam to scan around. But they're pulling a lot of information out. Now we go back to really small radars, typically running up at X-band. They have to be small because you want to get a height, a lot of gain, and a very small antenna that has got to fit up into the nose of an airplane. These are used for finding uh, military targets. They're used for uh, 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 observing and detecting and avoiding weather. They're used for mapping of the ground. And so you see a variety of these kinds of antennas mounted up in the noses of, um, of all kinds of uh, aircraft. This is a nasty now this is a view of a radar unit on the nose of a trainer aircraft, although there's, there's a fighter version of this aircraft. And here the antenna has been removed, but we, but we see the rest of the radar unit. This includes the power supply, cooling, transmitter, and receiver electronics and circuitry. Uh, clearly everything possible has been done to minimize both the size and the weight of this radar and get it to fit inside the nose of this uh, particular model of aircraft. This is an interesting radar system. This is a one-of-a-kind system. It's the NASA AirSAR, airborne side-looking airborne radar. This is a radar that's run as a test bed for radars on board the space shuttle. And what we see here are multiple band antennas mounted on the side of this aircraft. And this radar is flown on this aircraft to test hardware and software prior to installing the same hardware and software on the space shuttle for orbital flights. Again, this is a one-of-a-kind research uh, specimen of radar operating in uh, three different radar bands. This is a long-range space search and tracking radar. This is actually one face of a two-sided array that's built into a 10-story tall building that's shaped a lot like a pyramid. You can actually see the floors of the building. Here's the ground floor, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten stories tall, and here we were actually doing some calibration measurements, so we had actually moved a gantry out into the middle of the radar's uh, 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 array face. But what this radar is doing is forming beams by phasing multiple elements on the array face. Each of these array elements is a cross dipole, and then transmitting pulses into space, receiving echoes back, and again, receiving the echoes with the same phased array technology across the array face as is used to form the transmit beam. Here's a close-up of the array face. Here you can see more clearly the individual dipole elements along with the people who are doing some calibration up on the array face. I'm the person who's over on the far left. These are radar cross-section targets. These are calibrated targets. They are used to test the performance of radars. The target on the far left is a so-called corner reflector, which is made by basically just putting together uh, three sheets of metal and welding or soldering them to create a set of eight individual corners. This has the virtue of returning energy strongly in the same direction that the energy arrived. So if a radar pulse hits that object, and uh, reflects back, it'll, it'll produce a reflection back to the radar that's very strong in the same direction as the incident radar pulse was, and the radar gets an excellent radar return off of this. Uh, corner reflectors like this can be used to not only calibrate radar performance in terms of cross-section performance, but also to simply verify that, that if something is out there in space, the radar will see it and will return it. The yellow sphere in the middle, likewise, is a, is a, a standard calibrated radar target device that can be mounted on a pole at a distance from a radar. And finally, the corner on the far right is the same concept as the corner reflector on the left, but 
the corner on the far right has to be tilted or aimed roughly in the direction of the radar in order to produce strong returns. It is, however, a little smaller and a little more compact than the, uh, than the uh, corner that's over on the far left. Corner reflectors like the one on the far left and the one in the middle, by the way, are useful on maritime vessels, sailboats, uh, small boats, because they will produce a strong radar return even if the boat itself does not produce a strong radar return and these are vital to the safety of vessels at sea so that they can in fact be observed by by other vessels in foggy conditions or in the dark when as I say the boat itself which could be made of for example fiberglass might not itself produce particularly strong radar echo returns that concludes this uh, lab session